Well, amen. We're so glad that you are here today. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord. And we want to just thank you for coming. If you've been watching on Facebook today, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship the Lord with us today. And we trust that uh, it'll be a blessing to you. And let's stand together as we begin our worship and sing some couple songs today. And let's sing these out to the Lord and uh, lift it up to the Lord in praise. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the needs of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Justified fully through Calvary's love Oh, what a standing is mine And the transaction so quickly was made When as a sinner I came Took the offer of grace he did proper He saved me, oh, praise his dear name Heaven came down My Savior's love. Here's love. 
Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Yes, is the title of this song. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the songs of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful? can truly say, is it the love of Jesus, something wonderful, 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 oh, is it the love of Jesus, something wonderful, wonderful it is to be, love beyond our human comprehending, love of God in Christ, how can it be? will be my theme and never ending great redeeming love of Calvary is it the love of Jesus something wonderful of Jesus, something wonderful, 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 oh, is it the love of Jesus, something wonderful, wonderful it is to me. Yes, amen, 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 praise and the And you may Lord. be seated. What a great amen. day, what a wonderful opportunity to sing praises unto our God together in the congregation. Well, what a blessing. And of course, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? And uh, let me just say this, if you're at home watching on Facebook as we're worshiping the Lord together, by all means, let us know you're there watching, connecting with us, and let us know that you're there with us. And we love to to see who's connecting with us online and if there's anything that we can do to be a blessing or a help, we sure would love to do that at any time. Well, how has your week been, folks? I mean, it is October. How many didn't know that yet, right? Uh, it's October and uh, I know it doesn't feel like fall today, uh, but it's coming, amen, and it's going to be nice and I want you just to be excited about some of the changes. We're going to have a new season. Uh, they do joke a little bit in Arizona about we basically have two seasons, winter and summer, uh, but uh, fall is in there just a little bit. And uh, so we're going to have a season of change. The weather's going to change. And I just want to encourage you to embrace that change, see what God's going to do in this new season. Sometimes we have to put the old things away and begin new things. Sometimes we just have to recognize that uh, we are in his hands and uh, the day the way that I go he knows and uh, his ways are higher than our ways and we just got to trust in the Lord uh, many of you are doing that and I'm so encouraged this preacher is very encouraged by your faith well there's just quite a few uh, little announcements here want to make mention of several things uh, and of course, uh, uh, ever since uh, coronavirus came into the United States and infected uh, almost everything, it's really affected some of the, w the ways that we plan. And so we do a little bit shorter planning uh, because there's always something we don't know what's going on or anything like that. But we planned a few things and I just want to make you aware of a couple of things. In fact, uh, we decided that we're going to try to uh, have our midweek service this Wednesday. Uh, we have in-person services on Wednesday and we're trying 
let's have it an hour earlier. And uh, I think one of you said it so that Brother Panky could be in bed by 8, but I, I don't know if that's... It has absolutely nothing to do with that, okay? Uh, but if you want to come, we'd love to have you in person. Uh, we're changing the time, and we're also going to change the location. We're going to meet right in here in the auditorium, okay? A little more room, a little bit more uh, ability to social distance and make sure that everybody's feeling safe over there. Plus, uh, we've got a, quite a few items of the patio sale overflowing in our fellowship hall. And uh, so what we're going to do is we are going to have a patio sale, and it's going to be November 13 and 14. That's a Friday and a Saturday. And uh, we're definitely going to need your help on that following uh, Thursday to set up and to get everything out of the storage containers and, and uh, everything to be brought outside. We're going to have a great time. I really feel like this is going to be a good time. I think our people in our community are ready to say hello to people again, amen. And I think they're ready to kind of do something different than what they've been doing the last six months or something. And of course, we're going to be safe. And of course, we're going to take care of ourselves and uh, everyone's responsible for that, but uh, we're going to have that. So um, we're going to need some help on those days if you want to come out and uh, meet somebody from our community, invite them to come back on Sunday and uh, connect with them. I think that would be appropriate. We'd love to have you guys come out. It's a good time of fellowship. And if you have any more donations, uh, if you can, we could, we could take them in the fellowship hall. We do have a little bit of an overflow here. Uh, but if you can wait till the week of uh, the sale, that would be amazing too. And so whatever works for you in that regard. And so you won't be thinking about that. Of course, the men uh, have a uh, men's coffee hour on a weekly uh, time, Fridays at 8. Men, you're welcome to come for that. And uh, check with your Facebook feed on maybe the new passage of Scripture, the new prophecy or the uh, Messiah prophecy from the Old Testament to the New. That's usually posted on Facebook. And so we'll be studying that on Friday. Ladies, uh, we're going to have a very casual ladies' luncheon for all the ladies that want to get together in fellowship and just kind of, uh, you know what, touch base again. That'll be in the fellowship hall, and that's going to be on the 24th of October. Uh, and it's going to be casual, and I think it's 10 o'clock. Like I think that was 10 or it's 11. I was guessing. I thought, I'm going to guess this right, but, you know, I didn't. Uh, but 11 o'clock on the 24th, and this is just for any ladies that want to come and and, uh, you know, pretend to do what guys do on Friday at 8 o'clock, okay? Uh, but, no, you come and fellowship and have a good time. And, you know, during these times, um, good old-fashioned communication and conversations, I think, are really, really important. And uh, that, this is an opportunity for you to do that um, and, and to do it in a safe way. Uh, and to do it in, in a way where you know that everyone there... 100% cares about you and your health. So they're not going to, uh, you know, you go to the grocery store, you don't know who's in there, and you don't know if they're sick. You don't know if they've got coronavirus. And uh, there is a, it's safer. You can come, and you, you're assured that people love you, and they wouldn't come if they're sick, if they knew. They wouldn't do any of that. And you can, of course, uh, social distance and make sure that you stay healthy and safe. But also, Get that needed connection with others. It's very important during this time. And so I want you to be mindful of that. That's on the 24th this uh, month. It is October, and I'll just tell you what, um, I'm excited about fall. Um, I asked my phone, I said, phone, what is the temperature tomorrow? This was yesterday. It says 102, and I said, this is not fall. And of course, it didn't give me any reasons why or anything like that, but uh, but rest assured guess what in a week or two it's going to be quite the change and we're going to really enjoy these times so let's make sure that we uh, take every effort uh, to get outside to enjoy god's creation to do as much as we can to communicate with others and uh, i know for some you know you're out of practice of how to treat people so you might have to practice a little bit you know and actually be kind and, and, you know, practice your words, Brother Stoner. Practice saying thank you and, you know, you know, and say thank you, you know, I like you too. You know, these kind of things you might have to practice. But, hey, we all have these issues, but let's get back into practice of loving people, caring for people. 
But of course, you know what I'm not saying is disregard your health safety. Absolutely wouldn't do that. We understand uh, that our president and first lady and many others in government um, contracted the coronavirus. Praise the Lord. Uh, I think he said he's doing a little bit better today. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, but we ought to be praying for that. No one uh, sh deserves to have this or no one deserves to be sick. And so you be praying for one another in this regard. And, and it just kind of tells me a little bit if you get tested every single day and everybody around you gets tested every single day and you get it, I mean, it just means that it's here. And it just means that, you know, uh, it might be, you know, it's just around, it's everywhere. So do what you can, uh, protect yourself and uh, uh, protect those that are around you. And by all means, you know what, here at Canyon Springs, uh, if you feel f uh, comfortable wearing a mask, we want you to do that. If you uh, can't, that's fine too. Uh, but if you're at all feeling sick, feverish, coughing, hacking, or whatever, you know, you might want to stay home, and that way we don't kick you out the door when we hear you cough and all of that. <laughs> Have you ever been in front of someone, and they're just coughing and hacking, and you're like, you kind of scare a little bit about it? And, you know, we used to have, like, things like the flu and coughing and, and normal allergies, but now it's all coronavirus, so, you know. But uh, it's hard to tell the difference, isn't it? But just ask the Lord for some wisdom in that regard. Many of you asked how Mary was doing. Mary's here today. God bless her. Continue to pray for her. She's going to know a little bit more about the biopsy this week. She's got an appointment Thursday. Continue to pray for that. And pray for one another. We've got some folks that are not here today, not feeling well. Some folks that are, uh, have some compromised uh, health. And by all means, uh, we are just glad that you can connect with us at home. And uh, we love you. And if there's anything that we can do to be a blessing to you, we want to do that in a great, great way. Many of you came in the foyer. Some of you stuck, stuck in the back. And let me just share this with you. If you come in the foyer, you're going to see there's an offering envelope or offering box there. Feel free to give your offering on the way in or on the way out. Uh, if you're, you know, come on this side, you need to walk in the foyer, okay, and make sure you give that too. Uh, but uh, don't think you can get out of the offering by walking in the back door, okay? <laughs> we're watching. No, we're not. We're not. We're not. <laughs> but you could always give, and many of you are online, and I appreciate that, and many of you are taking care of... Uh, your faithfulness to the Lord, and, and I know, and I pray for you often that the Lord would just bless you for your faithfulness, and I believe that he will. And so let's go ahead and go to the Lord and just kind of be mindful of our day, uh, some of the times that we're living in, some of the things that are going on, our president and coronavirus, and some of the challenges of our country being divided, uh, some of these challenges that are going on, you know, what's the child of God to do? You know, sometimes the only thing you can do is really just cast that burden upon the Lord. And you do what you can on a daily basis, but you just leave the results to the Lord. And, and uh, you may not understand uh, all that you're seeing or what's happening, but one of the things that you know, if you have the Spirit of God in you, He will testify to you that you're His child and that you're on the right path and you're doing what is right. And if you do that, you'll honor God and be the light that God wants you to be, okay? So let's continue to do that. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 25, and we're going to be in other places, but we're going to be in Genesis chapter 25, and, and let's have a word of prayer, then we'll just dive right into the Word of God today, and I think it'll be a helpful to you and a blessing to you, and it's good to see each and every one of you. Uh, I, I tell you what, I, I really am thankful for all of our people here, and I'm thankful for you, and I'm thankful for this church, and the history of our church, and uh, the fact that we get to gather here and worship the Lord in such a way that we can uh, bring Him honor and glory. What a blessing that that is. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for this opportunity to meet together, to give together, to worship you in song, giving, and, of course, listening to your word. And I ask, Lord, that you'd meet some special needs today. Lord, we think of the doctor's visits this week, the health issues this week, the the, the body issues. Lord, we do ask that you would uh, protect our church family. We protect one another. I ask, Lord, that uh, the president and uh, his wife would, and all those in government that have been exposed and come down with this, that they would have a speedy recovery. 
And I do ask, Lord, that um, you would give us wisdom as Bible-believing individuals as to our part in standing up for righteousness, stating truth, and living for you. Give us wisdom on our daily basis about these things. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this opportunity. And we ask, Lord, that you would just bless us today as we are going to embark on a thought here that is, is powerful, uh, and uh, it's something that will, affects all of us. And I, help, I pray, Lord, that we might be a help to some. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's grab our Bibles, as I said before, and make our way over to Genesis chapter number 25. Uh, the last several weeks, uh, we have been journeying uh, with the nation of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness, and we spied out the lamb, and we talked about Caleb, and we talked about that principle of delayed gratification, and how important that is sometimes in our life uh, to be willing to wait on things of the Lord, because there's probably something far greater uh, far more wonderful than we ever possibly do. And also we learned that God's promises are sure. Amen. And so if God promises something, if it takes a little bit longer than what we would like, uh, God's the faithful one. Uh, and he's the one that you never have to ask, are you coming? Are you coming? He's never going to, you, know, you don't have to ask the Lord. He is always Faithful and true. Amen. Genesis 25. So this morning, uh, we're going to deal with um, an interesting passage. And we're going to talk about a principle that I think uh, will be helpful to us. Not Kind of like delayed gratification, yes. But um, it's about thinking about the choices that we make. Uh, there are some people that make some real terrible choices in life. Uh, choices that, uh, if they were honest and a little bit later in life, they would say, boy, I really regret making these decisions. I've got quite a few of those, so more than I can count on all my toes and all my fingers. Okay, i got a lot more. Um, but I think we're all commonality here today that we have some of those same feelings that we haven't always met necessarily made the best decisions. And decisions have ramifications and consequences. I was reading about what are the major bad decisions that people make, of course, you know. And there's a whole list of different things. And, and one article said, well, what was the worst mistakes or the bad decisions? Well, uh, uh, having the Trojan horse come into your city. That was a bad decision, right, you know. You're asking the enemy to come in, you know. Uh, the, uh, the Titanic, that was a bad decision, right? Um, I read about this article in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, medicine was coming up with different things, and they were using formaldehyde as medications for women who were pregnant to help with the morning sickness. Now, formaldehyde, of course, is a natural substance. It's pretty much in everything. But the way that it's synthesized and all of that, uh, they were using it, and it turned out not to be a very good idea. In fact, it was a very bad idea, and a lot of children were deformed in the 50s and the 60s because of these things, and it was just a bad decision. This is not going to work. It was a bad decision. And there's a lot of things like that that happen in our life that we probably regret. And we're going to look at the life of Jacob and Esau, Esau specifically today, uh, about a principle here of sacrificing our future or your future for the pleasures of the moment. This seems to be happening day in and day out. We have individuals that are consistently in their life very consistent in the fact that they often sacrifice their future for the pleasures of the moment and the moment, of course, you know, fades. We have it. Our culture is, I want it now. Our mind is, we deserve this. I need to have this. Everyone else does. I need it. Uh, we want it immediately. Now, 
Uh, I love technology. I, mean, I don't understand it all, but I'm glad for technology. Uh, I think it's uh, neat. I think it's uh, great that we have cell phones that we can talk all the way around the world and we can hear each other's voices and, of course, digital. We can see their faces now on our phones. Now, these technologies are amazing, but it just makes things so quick, so easy. That I'm wondering if the quick and easy could be dangerous. If you look at verse number 25 we see, excuse me, verse 24, we see that Rebecca is about to have twins. The Bible says that when her days were delivered to be fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. We have a twin up here. Uh, Elena is a twin. Her twin sister, Ilana, is at West Coast Baptist College. And, and so we always get to hear the stories about the twins. And of course, they always tell me uh, we are the same person, but we are different. So I have to hear that all the time, and I know that now. You are quite different, that's for sure. <laughs> and the Bible says here in verse 25, And the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took upon, or hold on, Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. And so we have this uh, twin, they're brothers, and we have Esau was the firstborn, the eldest, and then we had Jacob born. And he was holding on to the heel, if you will, of Esau. In verse 27, we see we know a little bit more about these twins. It says, and the boys grew. Now that's a good thing. Uh, all boys should grow, amen? All girls should grow. All babies should grow. That's a natural thing. That's a good thing. And so we're glad that both Jacob and Esau grew. And the Bible says here that and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Now, uh, verse 27, there's lots of observations there, but they both grew. Uh, and, but they were both very, very different, weren't they? Uh, Esau liked to be in the outdoors. He liked to go hunting. Uh, he was very good at hunting. And he liked to be in the field. That was where he was most comfortable. He, uh, Jacob, on the other hand, didn't necessarily like the field, didn't necessarily like the, the hunting trips, didn't necessarily like all that. He was more of a plain man. Uh, he was a, uh, a man of camp, if you will, and he dwelt in tents, and he was more comfortable doing some of the other things around the camp rather than being the hunter-gatherer type that Esau was. So interesting thought here. Both of these boys had the same parents, amen, right? Both of them grew up at the same time in the same family and the same experiences, right? Uh, and they had the, uh, but they were totally different and they matured different and they had different ideas about different things. And so guess what? That is, can happen. That can happen in our families. We have different personalities in my family. Some are a little more, uh, you know, sensitive. Some are a little less sensitive or however you want to view that. But these things are truth. And as this is playing out, we can just picture uh, these two different brothers, two different individuals, two different uh, personalities, if you will. I probably would have been a little bit more comfortable in the woods uh, hunting for venison than hanging out washing dishes with mama. I probably would have been a little bit more comfortable with that on a personal level. But everyone is different. And we see what happened here in verse number uh, 28. We're told a little more commentary that Isaac loved Esau because of the, he did eat his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. There was somehow their personalities were a little different that they were able to connect a little bit more with one of the parents uh, differently. And we see here in verse 29, and Jacob sawed pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint. And so Jacob had the pottage there, the, the lentils, it was there, and Esau came into the field and he was faint, the Bible says. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. 
Therefore was his name called Edom. He came in off the field. We don't know. Was it a long hunting trip? Was it a perilous hunting trip? Whatever it was, that he was famished. He was about ready to faint. He made it back home, and he was asking his brother to make him something because he just got back from the field. Jacob said, during this time, sell me this day thy birthright. Interesting. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. It's interesting to note in the culture of the Hebrews, the birthright was a very important thing. Maybe not so much now, today, in our culture, but the birthright was very important. It was the eldest son. And with the birthright came lots of privileges and responsibilities. There was a lot to honor involved in being the uh, individual that had the birthright. Uh, they were uh, given automatically the position of the headship or the leader of that home. They were, if you will, the priest of the family. They would offer the sacrifices for the family. And most of the father's possessions, and most of the father's possessions would go right ahead and be given once the father would pass away right to the firstborn son with the birthright. So, it was a very important thing. But yet we see in this passage that Esau did something unusual. He was willing to trade all of the future things that he was going to receive all for a bowl of soup. Now his reasoning was, well, I'm about ready to die. I'm almost a goner. It doesn't mean nothing to me right now. But don't we get in times of, in our life where we over-exaggerate things? Like the girls, I'm starving. <laughs> or we say, I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. <laughs> no, you're not going to die. Or we say certain things like that. But here was Esau. And according to what the Bible says there at the end of this chapter, that he despised his birthright because he didn't understand the value of it later. In fact, he learned that lesson quickly, and we're to see all of that, that eventually he wanted a blessing. He wanted this birthright, but he wasn't able to keep it because of this decision that he made. So his failure... All of the birthright went by the wayside, all for something fleshly. So the mindset is seen every day. Guess what we do? We think about things and we want them. Uh, we see it from Main Street, Wall Street. We see it uh, in our homes. We see it in our churches. We see it everywhere we go. This idea that I want it now rather than I want it in the future. We don't plan for the future anymore. We plan for the here and now. In the Gospels, uh, Jesus said, uh, eat, drink. They were partying and saying, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. That was their attitude. They were about the now rather than the future. I'm wondering, what is the opposite of Esau here? We get this clear picture of this gentleman that he loved the field. He loved hunting. And guess what? He loved everything about it. He was a young man. And guess what he thought? Guess what? I don't need the birthright. All I need is my bow and arrow. And I need a field to be happy and content for the rest of my life. He wasn't concerned about what it really meant down the line. And so he was eagerly not really wise, if you will, and he was able to sell this birthright for a pot of pottage, lentils. By the way, I don't really care for that too much myself. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't give much for it. But who is this opposite of Esau? Well, we think of Moses for a second. I do. If you go with me to the book of uh, Hebrews to this morning, chapter number 11, 
Hebrews chapter number 11, we get a little idea of Peter, uh, excuse me, of uh, Moses here. Hebrews chapter number 11. And look down with me, I believe it is verse 24. The Bible says here, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy pleasures of sin for a season. And so here is the quite opposite of Esau here. Esau was willing to give away some future blessings all for the present. But here was Moses, even though he was a, uh, he could have been called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and had a high position and had pretty much anything that he wanted. Listen, anything. The Egyptians were not moral people. He could have done anything and had anything, and he could have had everything that all of the people around us want today. And he would have been filled with all of that fleshly things. But the Bible says that Moses, because he had faith, he chose to suffer with the people of God than to enjoy that sin that just happens for a season. Now, we're in fall season today, October. Some of you don't know that yet. Too hot. I get it. But the seasons are changing. And we have them all the time, and pretty soon it's going to be winter, and then pretty soon it will be spring, and pretty soon it will be summer again for a long time. <laughs> but understand... That pleasure happens just but for a moment, but for a season. And Moses understood, notice what he understood in verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. He says, hey, if I suffer for the Lord, if I suffer for God here, that is far greater in eternity than any riches that I might be able to receive here in Egypt. He was able, if you will, to say, hey, I am not going to sacrifice uh, my future for the pleasures of the moment. I am going to make sure that I think about what's going to happen in the future. And the Bible says in verse 26, he says, for he had a respect under the recompense of the reward. He understood how important the future was going to be, and he was willing to make decisions based upon that. Here's the question. How about you and me? We have Esau pictured. We have Moses pictured. I'm just wondering, when do you and I sacrifice our future for the pleasures of the moment? How do we do it? When do we do it? You say, well, I don't do that. Maybe you don't, but maybe you do. Maybe you think you don't. Maybe you need to think a little bit about our decisions that we make because maybe we are sacrificing the glorious future that God has for me. Let me ask you, do you believe that God has his best interest in your mind or of you in his mind? Do you believe that? I do. I, I, I believe he wants great things for each and every one of us. <coughs> I believe he is not withholding the blessings from us because of any uh, ill will towards anything. I think he wants to open up the windows of heaven and wants to give us blessings. I believe he does. And so oftentimes we make choices, some good choices and bad choices. And there's some clear indications of when you and I are sacrificing our future for the pleasures of the moments. One of the ways that we do that is when we disregard the sacred values in God's word. When you go about life and you disregard, I put in my notes here, holy things. You disregard holy things. I think about the children of Israel as outlined in Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Basically, this is the gist. Hey, I love you. I brought you out. And if you serve me and you love me and you keep my commandments, I will bless you. But if you don't, 
I will cast upon you all the plagues or all the, uh, the things that I did to, Egypt, to the Egyptians. Hey, let's not go about our life just disregarding holy things. The commandments are commandments, not suggestions. Amen. Being kind and loving your brother is not an option. Loving all people is a commandment. Jesus says, you want to know who my disciples are? You'll know them by their love for one another. Paul says, for you and I to esteem others better than ourselves. You see, these are the things that we need to recognize, and we can't disregard the holy things. We can't disregard the sacred values, and a lot of people want to do it. Uh, and, and, and by all means... I understand what people say when they say that is old-fashioned. And I'm not talking about old traditions. I, I could care less about that stuff. But the values of God, the whole values of holiness, the values of what is right and what is wrong is something that we ought not to disregard. Esau had a birthright coming and he disregarded his responsibility in that, to protect that, to, to value that, to do all of that. We also uh, sacrifice our future for the pleasures of the moment when we go about our life insisting on immediate fulfillment for all of our desires. Hey, I got to have this. I, gotta, I need it. I'm miserable. I need it. How did that work out for David. He wanted Bathsheba, and he got Bathsheba. How did it work out? It kind of went the wrong way really quickly. It was but for a season. Not a very long season, by the way. And turned into murder, turned into lying, turned into you know, terrible things, turned into a little child dying, and turned into to the, the sword, the Bible says, goes upon all the house of David because of this terrible sin. Why? Because he wasn't willing, he wanted to sacrifice his future for the very pleasures of the moment. Now David is a man after God's own heart, and we've studied that before, and how he says, I have sinned against thee and thee only, we get it. And he got that forgiveness, and God could forgive all. But it didn't mean the consequences of that sin didn't follow him and his children and all through the lineage there. Do you insist on it? Do you insist on having this thing? Listen, we can't go through life insisting that our flesh gets fed every moment of the day. We have an overstimulus problem today. We have too much information, too much uh, comfort, too much everything, and we lose sight of the very important things. That's right. When our kids were small, you know, we bring them over to Grandpa's house, you know, and they're running around breaking stuff. That's what kids do at Grandpa's house. Isn't that what they do? I don't know. But, but, but my dad didn't like that, that they were breaking stuff. He thought they automatically should know at two years old, we don't do that around here. You know what I mean? He thought they should obviously know that. And um, so when the kids would go around, they would break stuff because they were kids. And Grandpa didn't like that. And guess what? He got upset about it. Now, guess, this, is, this is the idea. It's all about our perspective. When we have things in our life and we value them more than we do the things of God, and we always indulge ourselves in the things that we might need or the, the impulses or whatever we need for our desires, we begin to place higher things on those things than we do the things that God says to place highly, like people. I think it was a trinket, and I said, Dad, listen, it's, here's a buck. perspective, right? These are your grandkids. These, these are going to love you. These are going to push you around the wheelchair. Come on now. These are, this is, 
these are the ones that are going to... Perspective, right? See, what happens is, is we live a life like, like Samson. You remember Samson? He was a judge in the Old Testament, and God used him mightily to do a, a, a war for Israel to take the Philistines and to bring peace, and, and, and he was so strong. God gave him strong. But guess what he did? He sacrificed his future for the present pleasures of the moment. He saw a little girl by the name of Delilah, and he wanted her, and he got her. He didn't listen to his parents. And finally, he told her the secret of his power and what happened. He got bound. He got his eyes plucked out. He got a really cushy job at being the grinder and pushed a grinder around for the rest of his life. All because he could not He was willing, just like Esau, to sacrifice the very good things that God has already provided for him in the birthright, if you will. And he was willing to give that all the way because he didn't understand the times and the seasons. We got to be careful. We got to be careful. One of the things that we do is we sacrifice our, uh, our future. Uh, When we focus, that is, when we place our eyes on this world rather than the things heavenly or the things on this earth. You know the passage in Colossians 3.1. Set your affections on things above, not, not on things below. And so when you and I, we go about our life and we are just focused on something earthly and temporally and something that moth and rust are going to corrupt... We are, ha, are in jeopardy of sacrificing our future for the very present pleasures of the very moment. We want it now. We want this. We want pleasure. And there's some that they think, hey, I'm all about happiness. I'm all about fulfilling my flesh. And I'm going to do this. And I'm happy. But guess what? I, what you don't know is that God sees you. And what you don't know is that God sees all things and he knows your heart. And uh, what you don't know that God is probably in the middle of all of this uh, episode where you are giving and sacrificing your future all because you want some pleasures in this life and you're, un- uh, you're not even thinking about the things of eternity or the things that are, that are holy or sacred. You know what God says? Hey, I want you to prioritize me. I want you to love me. I want you to love me more than these things. And guess what? Don't be fooled. There is a law of sowing and reaping. That's right. And what you sow is what you will reap in the harvest. And you can't go through life living for pleasure and expect that God doesn't see all of that. See, you're sacrificing your future for the very moment. One of the things happens is, is we go about our life and we go in autopilot. And, and, and I think all of us can get into this as a zone in our life where we just kind of get up in the morning and we do the same thing over and over and over again. And we get in this routine, and sometimes it bleeds over to our spiritual life, and we begin to go and say, well, that was good enough then, and this is what I'm doing now, and we, we get, begin to compartmentalize our life. And really what's happening is, is as we're going down our life, we are sacrificing our future for the pleasures of the moment when you and I go about our life, and you just... Don't respect spiritual things. You don't respect the things of God. Right. We, we understand, uh, if you've ever been anywhere in, in this world, uh, the profanity, the profanity is overwhelming. It used to be a time when uh, only the sailor, sailors, like Brother Stoner, would be there, the <laughs> ones that were profane. But now it's just everywhere. 
And it's not just the men on the job, it's the women in the home. Or it's the eight-year-old telling their mother off. Our culture has been so profane. And the idea is, is that you ought not to take the name of the Lord in vain, right? You don't want to use profanity, we ought not to do that. And, and here's the idea. We have got to go out and not profane the things of God. Therefore, guess what? We ought to go and respect the things of the Lord. The things of God, our money, our resources, our, our responsibilities and our own stewardship. But if we're not careful, we go through life and we're not respectful of the spiritual life that we live. And we just go on autopilot and we just say, you know what, I went to church this year. <laughs> You're missing the point. And you are in grave danger of sacrificing your future for the moment. Well, I got a new boat, so I can't make it on Sundays. Ask Pastor Al how many times something similar has happened to him in his ministry. And we're not thinking, because we are ready to sacrifice our future for the pleasures of the moment. It happens all over the place. You remember Saul, King Saul, the first king of Israel. What happened to him? He was king, but guess what? He didn't respect the holy things. He didn't respect the spiritual things. And he went and he sacrificed before the Samuel could get there. And God rejected him and called David. But guess what? He didn't respect that God called David to be his heir on the throne. He rejected that. He, uh, he didn't respect it. So guess what? His entire life, he was consumed with killing David. Everywhere he went, he thought about David. Everywhere he went, he thought about ways that he could do it. And he lost his life. He lost his mind. He lost his sons. He lost everything because he wouldn't respect spiritual things. Amen. That mental anguish. You know, sometimes we wonder why we're so discouraged, so depressed, so distraught in our life. Maybe we're not considering the things that we should consider uh, on, the, on the business model. You know what they say? They say, uh, do calculated analysis of the decisions that you make. We say, just be wise about the decisions that you make, right? But when we fail to examine the possible consequences... I know that most people don't want to examine, well, if I do this, what will happen? We fail to do that, and what we're doing is sacrificing our future. Think about Judas for a moment. He was on board. He was a disciple. Walked with the Lord Jesus for three years. Ministered. But you know what happened? Judas understands some truth, but not all truth. And Judas thought, Jesus is going to overthrow the Roman Empire. And if I'm with Jesus, somehow that's going to make me rich because I'll be a leader in the new kingdom. And guess what happened when he didn't get his way and he didn't get what he wanted? He sold the Holy One. For 30 pieces of silver. Hmm. He betrayed him. Listen, when's the last time that you actually thought about the consequences of our actions? Now, I know, uh, it, it, I know it's not popular because we're supposed to just do you. No, let me be me and, and you do you. Now, granted... I'm glad there is a lot of truth in that. You should not try to be anybody else. You should try to be honest and have integrity and, you know what, uh, uh, in a place of a relationship with your God. But on the other end of it, maybe you shouldn't do you. Maybe you should change you. Maybe you should come to the place to say, how is this affecting me? Where is this going? 
What is happening? I think we got to come to the place where we begin to consider uh, what's God's will in all of this and what's God's timing in all this. Yeah. Don't be like Esau. And you know what? You, you're hungry. You're famished. And you know what? You don't really think about the future because you think you're going to be like that 18-year-old kid that all he wants to do is go hunting. And later recognize that he sold all of his birthright all because he didn't have the right understanding. Amen. All for a bowl of soup. Hmm. Oftentimes, we get, get involved in life and we fill our own bowl, if you will, with all sorts of things. We sacrifice our future. We um, say, I want the red pottage of lentils. I want that, and I'm willing to give up this. Uh, sometimes I talk to people, and um, they made a bad decision, and we all have, right? And they say... Pastor, this is what's happening, and this is, I did, you know, this, and then this, 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 and this, right? And I say, well, let me ask you this. What did you expect was going to happen when you did this? They didn't think about it. They never thought to think about, what are the consequences of this? How many marriages break up because they don't think of the consequences? And then now, not only do you used to have a, Harmony in the home, but now you got two bitter people, single people, all by themselves, miserable, all because someone couldn't give in. What is in your bowl? These consequences can be da disastrous. You know, sometimes what people do is they fill their bowl with all sorts of things. Because they're not really thinking about the future. They're not thinking about the consequences. Alcohol, for one. It's very sociably accepted. If you actually just think about it for just a little bit, why is it? Why is it socially accepted that you got to walk around your life uh, half-baked and incoherent and under the control of something so that you actually can manage life. It, it just doesn't make sense. Prejudice. People will say, well, uh, I'm just going to judge everybody around us. And so they say, hey, I'm going to judge this person and that person and this person. And that's all their bowl is filled with, is just judgmental. And so what it does is it forces you not to think about the beam in your own eye, so to speak. Drugs. Now, I know no one ever tends to be a drug addict, but it starts somewhere, right? That's right? And what do you expect to happen? Bitterness. Are you eating a bowl of bitterness today? Are you sacrificing your future all because you love to be bitter? I mean, some people tell me the kinds of foods that they like, and they're like, mm, I just love that. My daughter in Pensacola, she asked for some seaweed. I'm like, ah. Eating seaweed. Ugh. I don't want to eat that. But some of us go around and we love eating the bowl of bitterness. We just can rehash it all the time. It's like that leftovers that never leaves. We're having leftovers again, honey. We're having leftovers again. I think four or five times. Isn't there a rule, Tracy, for you? It's like leftovers for twice and then it's gone. I don't really like that because, you know, I'm like, we could use that for something, you know. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that how it goes? <laughs> adultery. We fill our lives with adultery. We say, hey, you know what? Uh, what I got is boring or whatever it is, and we let the TV tell us how it's going to work out. It's not reality. You are sacrificing the glorious future that God has for you. Abortion. Oh, it's a quick fix. You won't have to think about it anymore. You got yourself into some trouble, so guess what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and kill that baby inside of you, and nobody will know. And guess what? It's okay because it's your body. 
You know how much mental issues people that have gone through abortions have because of the horror that's involved in it all? They don't tell you about that. They don't tell you about the truth of all these things. But you know what? I, I, I don't want to be embarrassed. I, I, I don't want to be looked down upon. Uh, so guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and sacrifice the blessings of all of my future, all because I don't want anyone to think I was wrong. We joke about it a little bit, about how I finally got my mother-in-law to admit she was wrong. And it was like the glorious day. The angels were singing, ah. <laughs> it was awesome. I still remember it like yesterday. Oh, it was great. But some people have a little bit of a difficulty because they're embarrassed or they, they just don't want to admit that, you know what? I didn't make the recipe correct. Or you know what? I did something wrong. Hey, when did we get to the place to where we didn't want to accept the fact that we're all a little different and that we're all flawed. When is the time that we begin to do that? See, the reality is, if you just recognize who you are, the fact that you are clay formed out of the ground, the fact that you are in this fallen world with a flesh that is, goes against everything that you want to do, and when are you going to get to the place where you recognize that you don't need to give in to the flesh, and, but you want the bowl to be filled with everything that you want. I'm here to tell you. The truth is, we are all flawed, but the glory of the Lord Jesus, what he did for us on the cross, can cover that sin. If we confess our sins, and because he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me ask you, do you constantly sit down with a bowl of anger or hatred we're not to be hatred we're not to be hateful you not to wish anyone to die i mean that is straight from the pit of hell you ought to love people and care for people but when we when we're eating this bowl of anger we're just holding on to it and we say, this person hurt me, and this person did this. But really, who's it hurting? You. Right. Most people don't even know you're upset with them. And by the way, if it's your mommy and your daddy, and they're all gone, and they're in the ground now, guess what? You're not hurting them. You're not making them pay for what they did by you being bitter. You're just hurting yourself. Amen. And it's time for you to stop sacrificing the future blessings that God desires for you, all on the present and all on the things that, if you will, don't last. Solomon said about this world, he's seen everything, and he says, all is empty, it's vanity, it's vanity. But somehow, when you look at it, you see it differently. You see, you got a little pride where you're like, no, I got this. I, I can handle this. I can do this. Listen, if I asked you the decisions that you were going to make and I pointed out that you're going to suffer because of this decision, uh, would you do it? Would you continue to eat that bowl? Well, we do. We know anger, anger and bitterness is harmful to us. We get stressed out. We have uh, all sorts of ulcers. We have all sorts of other problems because of our hatred and our anger and our bitterness. And, and you know what? Our fact that we can't uh, consider the Lord in all things. We get our mental, just like Saul had, this, just went crazy a little bit because guess what? I am uh, suffering the consequences of my own sin. Listen. The question this morning, and maybe something that you and I can really begin to ask the Lord to help us with, is making good decisions so that we don't sacrifice the future. Amen. Esau did it for a bowl of soup. And I think you and I need to understand, we don't need to do that. We've been promised a bright future, friend. You say, 
Look outside you, pastor. It's not bright out there. Listen, if you're a believer and you know Jesus, you've been promised a very bright future. Amen. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. In a moment and twinkling and a shout, guess what? We'll be meeting him in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. All the tears and all the heartache and all the loss will go by the wayside and we shall ever be with Amen. the Lord. Let's not go about our life making decisions that sacrifice the blessings that God wants to give us. You know, one of the things that we don't have in our culture is patience. I had to wait in line a lot this week and I thought about how I don't have patience. One time I was in the line and I left. I couldn't handle it. I'm like, I'm out of here. You know, you know, because you got to be mad when you do that, right? You know, because someone's t taking too long, right? Um, and I'm not condoning that kind of acti activity or that, those things. <laughs> but is there some things in your life, is there some things in your bowl that you're constantly sacrificing your future with? Would you just go to the Lord this morning and just say, God, forgive me of this. I've been holding on to this bitterness, this anger, this hatred, this prejudice. I've been holding on to these things. and I'm all about me, my, and everything to do with me. And I need to make sure that I'm not sacrificing my glorious future that God has planned for me. Listen. There are some truths. And like Moses said, the pleasures of sin for a season. Some of the most successful people in the world are the ones that understand seasons. Because it's not always going to be always bad. It's not always going to be always good as far as harvest. And so if you recognize these things, that it goes in seasons and out of seasons, you can make wise decisions and say, you know what? I'm going to be wise about this. Instead of casting all of my seed on this crop, I am going to maybe diversify a little bit and have some other things going on because I don't want to sacrifice my future on getting rich. I don't want to sacrifice my future on uh, some idea or because I feel a certain way today. You know, sometimes what happens is we're a little bit like Elijah. We're down physically. We're discouraged. We're um, you know what? We don't feel good, and so we make decisions based upon our feelings, and you know what? You regret them. I do. You do. I know this is to be true. And so we got to make sure that we're not making decisions based upon when we're in the lowest part of our thing. The girls got their wisdom teeth taken out. I think it was last year, the year before. You know, who knows nowadays how much time lasts because of corona. It's like it's just everything's just kind of bundled together. But they got their wisdom teeth taken out. And, you know, they give them a little bit of the anesthesia and the drugs. And they're a little loopy and goofy. And I kind of liked it because I was talking to them and asking questions. And, <laughs> you know, and trying to figure out what's really going on. And, and Calista was really good. She's like, she wanted to talk back, but she knew she, she didn't want to let things out, you know. And I was pumping her for information. And she, she did good. Then she just smile. <laughs> but she, she, she knew because the doctor says, don't do any driving. Don't make, you know, don't make any legal decisions during this time because guess what? Uh, you might regret it, right? And you know what, Christian? I think it's a good idea to ask the Lord what his will is. And guess what? Very few things in the Christian life you need to be impulsive about. Often Satan does a good job at tempting you into impulsivity so that, guess what, you go down the wrong path versus God's path. Let's ask the Lord to help us to make sure that we're not sacrificing any of the good things for the things that are not that great anyways. Have you noticed that? Cars, they get older. They need to be replaced sometime. Things that are new, they break. 
things that we desired, you know, we really wanted something and it wasn't as advertised. But let's not go around in our Christian life just sacrificing the spiritual blessings of God because we are unwilling to make sure that we care about the things of God, we care about spiritual things, holy things, God's word. We need to be out there asking God to help us as he guides us this week in our own personal life. Let's pray together. Lord, we're mindful of your goodness and your care. We're mindful of how you guide and direct us, and we're asking you, Lord, through this invitation, that you would just direct us on an individual basis, that if there be any area in our life that we would be sacrificing on the altar of the now, help us to recognize that. Help us to be mindful that we don't want to throw our future away for the moment. Lord, touch us, convict us, guide us, give us the wisdom to how to apply these principles in our own life this week. I'm wondering if the Lord spoke to you, if you want to be honest with God and just recognize that to the Lord. Say, Lord, I want you to know that I heard you. And there's this area in my life that you talked to me about and I heard you and I'm going to, I'm convicted about, I'm going to do something about it. Anybody like that? I see that hand and that hand and that hand and that hand all over. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's working. And maybe you're here and you've never come to a place in your life that you've been born again. You know about the Bible. You know about what Jesus did, but you've never personally trusted Jesus as your Savior. I want to invite you to know Jesus as your Savior. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe that's you. I want to encourage you to search me out. Find somebody. Ask him how to be saved. We'd love for that to happen. We're going to have a, Mike's going to sing a hymn of invitation and we're going to have a prayer here. And just do a little business with the Lord during this time. This is for you. Let's pray. Lord, bless this invitation. Have your will and way, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand if you can. Mike's going to sing. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can attention to the Word of God this morning. And uh, just remember this week, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a Bible study online through Facebook. It's going to be great. I encourage you to make sure you and your family are ready for that. Also, 6 o'clock Wednesday, we're going to be meeting together, and we're going to be meeting right here in the auditorium, okay? And so you be mindful of that. Mike, go ahead and uh, close our service at a word of prayer, and uh, we'd love to uh, know how you're doing, so let us know. Heavenly Father, we come in prayer thinking about the message that we've heard, about the things that we think about, the things that draw us away from you, the things that look so good, but Father, really we pay for it in the end when we realize that uh, they're not as shiny as we thought they were, they're not as much glitter as we expected. So Father, as we go through the day, as we go through this following week, let us think about this message. Let's think about Jacob and Esau and the choices they made. Let's think about the ones that uh, lead us away from you, Lord. 
It can be many things. We are not always looking towards you, Lord, but we pray that you would help us to do that. So guide us through this week. Help us to look at your scripture. Help us to look at our friends that set examples that we are to follow. Lord, let us, let us just look for you yeah. in everything that we say and do. May you be honored in what we do. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.